Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. This is your host, Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us today. This podcast is powered by Stick and Ball TV, the baseball and softball streaming platform. If you're a coach and you're looking for a resource to help you get better, then Stick and Ball is just for you. With weekly updated videos from some of the best baseball and softball coaches in the country, it's a no-brainer. Check them out at stickandball.tv or on the Stick and Ball TV mobile app. On today's show, we have on part two with Tom Marker, head baseball coach at Olin Tangy Orange High School. In this episode, we discuss what they do for preseason, how to train in game-like environments, and in-game data they track. You're going to love this episode with Tom Marker. So when do you guys, uh, you said you had tryouts in February. Is that when you start your preseason stuff and you're actual like preparing for the in, for in season? Yeah. I mean, I would say that's when we start our team stuff. So the six player workouts really help us in terms of individual training. Um, but when we have our tryouts in February, uh, everybody does them differently. You know, you can hold trials as long as you want to have tryouts for us. It's a three day period. Um, and then we name teams and then we get into our t- team training. Uh, because we open up the last weekend in March is usually the first day that we're allowed to play games. Uh, so we have about a month to prepare for those first games from a team standpoint, you know, we can still throw bullpens and we can still have hitting sessions and do all those things in the six player workouts. But as far as, you know, if, if, whatever you want to do from a team concept, um, that doesn't happen until, you know, basically the f- month of March is really your lead up. So that's what I would deem preseason. Um, but at that point, when we get into March, our guys have been throwing bullpens probably since January. Um, you know, catchers been doing their training, hitters have been doing their training and things along those lines. But as far as the team concept, yeah, that happens in February after tryouts. Perfect. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what your, uh, whenever you do, whenever you are able to, you know, open it up rather for the individual work. Now you're getting ready uh, for team practice. How do you open up? What does your first month look like? What are you really focusing on? I know you mentioned getting arms ready, which is probably the most important thing we do, but what else? Yeah, I would think it's like it's almost as much for coaches as it is for players. We're just trying to find a way to blend the the group, and you bring in your newcomers, and and you have your returning guys, and just trying to find a way to get the 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 best team on the field, and then also finding out how those complementary players help out in different aspects. I think it's a real eye opening period of time. I think the pace in which we train, if because a lot of times in in Ohio you're inside, and so your indoor team sessions don't look like a traditional team setting. It's not your on-field BP and your cuts and relays and things along those lines. Um, So you have to be really strategic. For us, it's probably a little bit longer in the classroom and a little bit less time actually doing the the drills and skills um, until we can get outside. Now, we do have turf going in right now, and so hopefully that allows us to get outside a little bit sooner. Um, but I would say like, we don't do bunt defenses. We don't do first and third defenses. Um, I know a lot of people say, you know, I spend this much time on bunt defense. We, we didn't work on bunt defenses once the last two years. Um, same with first and third, first and third, maybe a, a couple of days here and there sporadic, but, um, we have a way that we, we, I guess, um, train those situations, but it's not um, a blocked off period of time for bunt defenses and first and thirds and first and third offense and things like that. We're a little bit vanilla in that regard, but I think it's, it's helped us kind of keep it a little bit more simple. Um, but it's, it's a lot of competition. We do live bullpens at that time where we're throwing against hitters and then we're tracking certain things and looking for, um, you know, ways to get our program in a position to play at, at the end of March. So for this year, you know, we're heading down to play. I think you had Jeff Sherman on the call at Marcus high school. We're going down to play Marcus high school, McKinney Boyd, um, playing three games down in Texas. And so those guys will be outside and, and so we're looking for a way to to close the gap on some really, really good teams while we're training inside and they're probably playing games outside. So nice, no um, but the team's just different. It's just different because when you're inside, it's not as much of a team training. Sure. No doubt. So you did a, I think it was a barnstormers clinic over optimal training environment. So dig into the, to that a little bit. I'd love to hear, I didn't get a chance to listen to it yet, but just what you talked about, what are some ways that we can, you know, still reps and, and make training game like, yeah, I mean, I, I think people have probably beat it to, to death, the zoo tiger and the jungle tiger, and I think everybody's heard it, heard that many, many times. Um, for us, it's just we're trying to create an environment 
that's most game like as possible. And so for me being a math background and, and data analytics and things like that, I think you have to really look at everything from how high and how far back you set up to your machine to what spin it has um, to what's your desired result on the given day. So for instance, to me, like I would, I would love to talk to people who still love teas. Not that I, again, teas are good for some things, but I think people think they're good for things that they're really not. Um, so for us, it's sitting down and saying, okay, what's the desired result of the training session? And then how do we put our guys in a position to struggle and also to grow? So for us, like for instance, um, maybe we're going to train, uh, uh, you know, 85 to 90 on the outer third, uh, with, uh, get me over breaking balls. And so we'll set, we'll, I'll send out the practice or the training plan to our assistant coaches in the morning. I'll say, okay, this is what, this is what the segments look like. Do you see any errors there? And then I also think it's really important, um, how you group guys in, in an indoor training environment. Um, because for us, it's not just developing the baseball piece. So for instance, um, I mean, we're so detailed in the sense that, if we're going to go inside and hit and let's just say um, we're going to have four guys in a group and they're going to be hitting, get me over breaking balls. And then the next one over is fastballs away, just for instance, off a machine. It's so important who we group with who. So we may be grouping two guys together because they never talk. We never see them communicating together. So it's important that they're together or we may be grouping uh, left-handed hitters together. So we don't have to move the machine and then we'll start them on the last machine. So, or I'm sorry, we'll start them on the next to last machine where the last machine is the one that we have to move or whatever. So we're just trying to create a plan that is orchestrated such that there's very little downtime and that every single thing that they're doing there is for growth. And so we used to be hitting stations and I think people still do that where they would say, okay, well, we have 16 guys. So that means we need to have eight stations so we could have two guys in a group. And so let's do high T here and front toss here and this there. You're doing a lot of drills that don't mimic anything game like. And so that's one thing I've been really reading about and really trying to understand is like, how do you make the most game like um, environment in your training? So that's to me the most, important thing out of anything is make it as game like as possible no doubt you mentioned the uh taking out the t or uh, limiting some of the use or making it more uh more applicable to what you're doing rather you know uh, achievement rather than activity were there any other things that come to mind that you're like yeah we switched from this to this and that was you know either a big deal for us or it was something that goes against traditional norms um we got away from front toss a lot uh, yeah. just because the angle in which the pitch comes in, um, just underhand. Flips. Yeah. I just, I'm kind of against it a little bit unless it's really done properly. I think coaches can do it a little better than kids because it, sometimes kids lose the focus and the importance of, of how you deliver that pitch. Uh, mm-hmm. so we've done more overhand front toss in it seated in a chair. Um, I know when, depending on the picture we're going to see, but we'll set up like, um, machines, in our facility. And then the day before the night before the morning before our coaches will go in with rap sodas and set those up to see what the spin is and what the, um, like the arm ain't like where the release point is and things and try to match it to the mm-hmm. pitcher. And people will say, well, that's overkill, but it may be, but to me, it's getting closer and closer to the game like environment. Now we don't talk to our kids about, Hey, this spin rate is this and this, no, but we're going to use as much data as we can to create the most live, uh, game like situation. So like even in BP, so when we were throwing BP last year, um, we set a gun on our, on our BP pitching coach and just said, okay, he's throwing this hard routinely from this distance and that replicates this mile an hour. So he needs to move to this spot or, you know, you'll talk about a BP pitcher that only throws strikes. Well, that's not good. Like you, you've got to throw Mm -hmm. balls or, um, we've mixed uh, hard softs into our, into our ball carts. And so that we can purposely bean guys during BP so that they can get used to it because it looks just like a game ball. Right. And so if there's any flinch there, the round's over because mm. it's just not going to hurt them, but they have to learn how to properly wear a pitch and then also how to stay on their ground and, and drive baseball's opposite field or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever the case may be. So I just think I like that again, just trying innovative ways to make it as game like as possible. You did a, uh, I don't know if it was a research project or you did some research over hit by pitches and win percentage. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. 
Yeah. So when I was at Bexley, um, which is a division two school in this area, we, we had a smaller size team, some young guys, a bunch of sophomores, we didn't swing it real well. And I didn't feel like we held our ground on breaking balls. And so myself and, and one of our assistant coaches, Eric Williams kind of looked into just some teams that have had some success in turning programs around. And the two we came to were Vanderbilt and Campbell, Campbell university. Um, and what happened was their hit by pitch totals had gone up tremendously. Like for instance, um, trying to think what it was with Campbell. Campbell was like, they had a losing season and they were at like 46 hit by pitches. They had a losing season. They were at 52 hit by pitches. Then they had a winning season. They were at 117 hit by pitches. They haven't been below a hundred, a hundred hit by pitches since then they led the nation in hit by pitches last year. And if you correlate like hit by pitches and batting average. So for instance, the team that had the least amount of hit by pitches last year, had the lowest batting average and also won zero games. Now, again, they played less games, but they, they won zero games. Um, Campbell, who's in the top 10 um, of hit by pitches, is also in the top 10 of runs produced and also in the top 10 of batting average. Um, you know, Vanderbilt was another one I looked at because Vandy, like in 2000, I think it was like they went from 69 to 124 from like 2009 to 2010. Um, and so – their ability to wear pitches. Now, again, somebody goes, well, it's not because they're wearing pitches that they have a higher batting average. I disagree. I think it has a, a definite um, effect. But if you think about it, the higher velocity arms usually are arm side run guys. And so if they're arm side run with less control and you take away the inner third of the plate, now you can look middle away. And also it's easier to hit 95 on the outer half than it is 95 on the inner half. Um, so yeah, we just started to look at hit by pitches and the value of those and finding ways to get on base, but also finding ways to hit the breaking ball effectively, That's finding ways to hold your ground and really drive the ball to the backside. So, I mean, there's just like, if it Campbell's a really, a really good case study for anybody looking at hit by pitches, I think they're one of them. Southeast Louisiana is really good, um, at wearing pitches, but I, I even looked at, you know, I was talking to one of my buddies, who's an assistant coach. I won't bring up the school, but he said, "Where were we at?" And I said, "Well, you were 173rd in hit by pitches. You were 184th in batting average, and 181st in in runs scored. So they're pretty well correlated." And people talk about correlation versus causation, and I don't want to get into all that, but I would say that they definitely the ability to wear a pitch does does play a factor in your ability to score runs and your ability sure. to raise your batting average. No doubt. I I think even. I never thought about staying in on a breaking ball and how that flinching on a, on a curveball uh, can affect that. And so I think that that's, that's something else that, that I'm, I'm writing down over here of, Hey man, it's like, especially with high school with a big loopy curveball things, you know, with, with righties too. I think that that's something that is probably undervalued with, uh, with, with some in-game data though. I, I think that this, this is interesting. So I saw that you were on a podcast uh, with Trey Cobb, a, maybe earlier this year, and you talked with him about in-game data like quite a bit. So th- this is something that I would really like to dig more into because it's it's I would it's it's an area that I would like to get better at for sure. So what it would you know we we talk about quabs and what you know what does that mean to you? How are you teaching it? But also what are some different things that you're looking to uh, looking to to increase uh, your chances of winning? like the hit by pitches. I think that that's a great example. So do you have any more other, other examples of like that, of, of what you're looking, tracking, trying to get them to understand and, and just essentially what data have you found that, that people aren't talking about enough that's helping you guys to win games? I would say uh first pitch swing percentage is, is, is important. First pitch strike swing percentage is, is one that I would really look at. Like how, how often you take a pitch, a uh, first pitch strike, I think is, is a big thing. Um, I think catching barrels. So, so did you barrel a ball or not? And I know people say, well, that counts as a QAB and for some it does, but I think that's a a vitally important one for us. We, we have a tendency and I think high school across the board has a tendency to take pitches that are first pitch fastball away. And, um, I don't remember what year I tracked it, but the, the teams that we saw through 87% first pitch fastball away. And so, and that was probably at all that's probably the pitch that we took the most. So like, even if you think about you calling pitches or your catcher calls pitches, first pitch of the game, he's going fastball away, right? Like 95% of the time. And so um, I think your swing percentage, and then also how often you take that pitch. We had, we talked to our lead off and our two hole hitter last year. And we we thought about flipping them um, both really good players. Both are D one commits. One's actually playing division one baseball right now. And the other one's a senior this year. He'll be going to Vanderbilt next year. Um, But we talked to him because our lead off hitter, was swinging at a ton of first pitches. 
I mean, a ton. And everybody says, well, leadoff hitter should work to count and this and that. And, and we always told him, if you get a first pitch fastball, go ahead and jump. I mean, he, he has power, but he can fly. He set the record for triples and he's just a really good hitter. Um, and then our two hole was seeing a lot of off speed pitches. Um, again, being a Vanderbilt commit, I think a lot of people knew that going in. And so he was taking pitches early in counts and he was, he was, Again, probably because I did a poor job of communicating, but he he once said to me, he said, you know, I didn't think I was supposed to swing at first pitch curveballs. You know, you'll hear people say, well, don't swing at curveballs until you get two strikes. And if you're a Vanderbilt commit, you're going to see first pitch curveball, probably second pitch curveball, and some of those are just going to be getting the overs, and you got to jump them. So um, just looking at, like, how often he swings and in what county swings and what county gets certain pitches and, and having – conversations about what what are you hunting in certain spots and, and things along those lines. But I think in-game data, just knowing what you're hunting and what you're hitting and and what kind of pitches you're taking, I think is, is really valuable for players, you mm-hmm. know, and, and having that behind the backstop view video tells, tells a lot. So I think that one's big. Um, but before you, before yeah, you go to the, to the next one uh, or the next few, which I'm sure we could do an entire podcast over that. How are you, how are you teaching it? So you're having these conversations and I've, you know, I've talked to a few people about, you know, maybe even, you know, tra- how do we track swing decisions without, ha- we have a, a flight scope, but half the time it's, it's not ideal. And so, uh, you know, it, what are some, what are some ways that you found to be able to teach that along with uh, your game like environments, but like taking that piece from the game, having them even reflect upon it or having them uh, do some sort of exercise with, with their swing decisions. And I, I would really like to hear your thoughts on it or even do you guys. Yeah, no, we, we have, we've done a few things and and some have been successful. Some haven't. So I have like a a Google sheet that I created where if you, and there are two that are form uh, formatted such that if you type results in one sheet, it goes to the next tab over and it'll, it'll categorize those into the nine hitting zones and what your swing percentage is. And then the next tab over will calculate based off of your exit velocity and um, your average exit velocity, were you above or below? And then it'll highlight that nine hitting zone based on, on the pitches that you swung at, how many did you hit within a certain range of that exit velocity. But we use that more so for us than we do with the kids. I think some of that will be data overload. So we use that more so with like how we're going to create the training environment the next day or the conversations we're going to have. Probably got to give our kids a little bit more ownership over it. We talk to them about it, but that's where the classroom comes back in the next day. So a lot of times this past year, um, we would watch the film the night the night after the game and then come in with a few clips and talk to kids about, you know, a kid may say, well, that fastball it was way outside. And then when you show the clip, they're like, man, maybe it just, it, just, it wasn't, it wasn't. I was, I, but if they were to tell me I was sitting middle in, I felt like it was too far outside, then that's a good answer. Because when you sit middle in, a pitch on the outer third seems like it's a mile mm-hmm. away. Um, sure. But I just think, again, it goes back to having those conversations about what are you hunting uh, you know, and if they say I'm, I'm sitting middle away, but that pitch was off. Well, if you're sitting middle away, a pitch one or two balls off is, is still a ball that you can absolutely hammer. Um, mm-hmm. And then as far as training it too, I think we do some things where like even during ball ball games, if you throw a first pitch strike, it counts. You go to O2. If you take a first pitch strike, I'm sorry, it's O2. If you, if the pitcher throws a first pitch ball, it goes to two O. So it just hones in on the importance of throwing strikes and then also swing at strikes in the zone. Yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, we, we've trained it some different ways. I think another way too, is to train like b- bad ball swings. So for mm-hmm. us, like if you do flips or side flips and flip them out of the zone, but show a kid that like, if you catch a barrel, you're still going to square it up and hit it pretty well. It doesn't have to be over the 17 inch plate in order for you to drive it. So right. no doubt. That's cool. Well, with that, I, you know, I think that that's, a, that's really neat. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you mentioned was the more you swing, the more you walk, which I think that that's an interesting, you know, comment. And it's, it's, it's contrary to, you know, the Oakland A's of taking a, a ton of different pitches. They're also seeing big league guys. They're not seeing, you know, high school kids that we see. You still, does that, is that still truthful to you? Is that still something that you believe in? Yeah, I think, I think for, again, it depends on the team you're going to face and the pitcher and things along those lines. But sure. I know well, we, when we played um, Jonathan Alder, my, one of my buddies, the head coach Jonathan Alder, does a phenomenal job. And and when when they were really playing their best baseball a few years back, uh, they were first pitch aggressive. 
and they were so aggressive that teams would want to nibble. You know, they'd want to throw that first pitch curveball or the first pitch fastball off the plate. Now they're 1-0 because they knew how aggressive they were. So I think the more aggressive you are, um, it makes pitchers nibble more. It makes pitching coaches get a little bit more nervous about what they're calling in certain counts. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it could lead to that. It, it, again, it depends on the team you're playing and, and what, sure. what your report says. But absolutely, I like, like I think anytime you're aggressive – Anytime that you can change or you can speed up the the heart rate or the style of play of your opponent based on what you're doing, I think it's it's huge. Like what's we about being able to play offense on defense, right? Like you gotta move. Mm -hmm. You gotta move. And so um Well that's cool. I think it does. So with uh with a game like a training environment, uh you know, I've only got a couple of questions left for you, but but thinking about in season practice advice. So this time of year uh, this will be part two of our of our series, but you've got you know you got coaches out there that are listening that are going through their first season, and either thinking back or thinking about those guys. What are some ways that you found during the season, which you know here in Oklahoma we could play three, two or three ga da games a week, or we could play five. Uh, I know I remember when I was in Texas, we played you know twice a week most weeks, which is a, a pl completely different environment. Whenever you're doing that, you have more days off, you have more time to do things, but. I would love to hear your advice for how to efficiently run practice during a season, you know, managing energy uh, and different things like that. So keeping those, you know, the first year head coaches in mind who are curious, uh, what would you tell them? Um, I'd start by saying, don't think you have to practice for four hours. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I think being efficient, being very detailed, and then also trying to get um, like, I don't know, you could say like killed, two birds with one stone type of idea or type of plan. So for instance, if I'm going to do on-field BP, it's not simply on-field BP. It's defensive on-field BP mixed in with base running, like the Monty Lee type stuff that he talks about in terms of um, on-field BP. I think that's vitally important. I think utilizing your time um, as wisely as possible in, in valuing your players' time in terms of, you know, they, they need to get home and do homework and they need other things to do. So when they're at the baseball field, they need to feel like there's value in every single minute. Um, when we get into season, our schedule is usually Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then a single or a doubleheader on a Saturday. So the way we train is usually Tuesday is going to be a, um, a heavy training day um, maybe some scouting report type stuff. And then we work in a period um, every day in our training based on a team within our league that we think we need to prepare for. So for instance, uh, if you were a football coach going to and Navy was in your conference, which they're not in a conference, but if they were in your conference, you would have an option period in your, in your, in your training, right? Every single, every single day you'd have an option period, even if you weren't playing them that week. And that's kind of how we train on Tuesday. So we think about like, okay, this is the, and again, I'm not going to go into what team it is, but there's a team in our league that we call it that period. And sure. we train our Tuesday very hard. When we get to Thursday, we call it a PD day. And so usually mm -hmm. on Thursdays it's professional development. And what we do is we open up our facilities um, from after school until about five o'clock. So about a two hour window roughly. And we just tell kids to come in and get the work in that they need to get in. So it's their personal development. So a kid may come in and say, I need, I'm going to, I'm going to long toss today and coach, I want to take some ground balls on the field or coach. I want to hit some, um, I'm going to hit off the machine and then I'm going to, um, foam roll and I'm out of here. Another guy may say, I'm, Hey, I'm just going to check in and, load the machine for Billy while he hits or whatever the case may be. So Thursday's professional development or personal development day, we just call it PD. And then some kids may say, I'm going to hang out with my girlfriend and that's fine too. That's, whatever your personal development is that day on that Thursday, you're going to do it. Now, what do the majority of our guys do? They come in and train. They come in, you know, our, our number one arm would come in and do his plyo wall stuff. And he was also our three hole hitter and he might take about six to seven swings and call it a day. But I mean, I think that check-in piece and giving them some ownership over it um, is very important. And then Sundays we usually use for a weight room day um, or, you know, again, if, if they have church that day or they have family things, by all means, they go do that. Uh, but mm -hmm. we also open up the facilities on Sundays as well for them to come in and get some work in. But our yeah. when we get into season, it's um, usually Tuesdays our big heavy day and then, you know, play Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I love it. The last one I've got before we, you know, get to the resources and, and wrap this thing up, which number one, I, man, I'm, I'm writing down some copious notes here because I, I really think that, that you're doing some really cool stuff. 
with a, with a scouting piece, how, how do you do that with other teams? You ta- you've talked about, you know, preparing for different teams in your league. How do you go about that? Especially being a head coach, you're usually playing most of the days that the other teams that you're trying to play against are playing. So how do you go about scouting other teams? Um, I mean, there's so many ways to go about it. I, I think about it like poker tails, right? And so um, if I know, so summertime's big for me and I just try to go watch pitchers a bunch in the summer and just try to see how or why, or if they even, what do they do that tips pitches? Do they have tendencies? Um, you know, there's so many ways to, to, to know what pitches they're going to throw or prior to even the first movement of their body. Um, I think that's important. Um, I think scouting lower levels. So like if I were a football coach, I would go to every JV and freshman game and just scout the other team. Now, again, with football, you can't, at least in Ohio, the freshmen and JVs play after the varsity. But in baseball, if you can go to a JV or freshman game and watch them, you can scout a freshman or JV game to get information about the varsity game because a lot of times freshman and JV coaches are more verbal. So like if they miss a sign, they'll say, you didn't see me do this or you didn't see me do this. And, and so they'll, they'll tip the signs that way. Or if they run certain um, team defenses or bunt defenses or things along those lines, they'll show those in situations that you may not see them in a varsity game. So I think that's really, really important. Um, but I think about like from a bird's eye view of tells and then in-game scouting too, because I think you can watch movements and man mannerisms of players during a game and they tip off certain things. Um, so that's, that's really important too. Like, I think, um, like a lot of times when I scout in the summer, I'll watch catchers too, because I feel like t- catchers give away pitches more than anybody on the field, more than a coach signaling in or a pitcher. I think a catcher will give you, give you pitches. So for instance, it was, um, 2018, yeah, 2018, we were getting ready to go play a team. And, and so we get about a week off before the tournament comes. And so I went and watched this team play twice. And then I traded some huddle film and I, I thought about some things and I, and I watched this catcher and I watched this catcher and he tipped every pitch every single time, um, tip the pitch away. So I, th- I think that's important too, is just the ability to, to watch and look for tells. Um, and then lastly, I think it's just trying to find low hanging fruit, like where you can have an edge. Um, for instance, looking at statistics. So, um, played a team last year in the playoffs or in the tournament, um, where the pitcher they were throwing hit, hit a lot of people. So had a lot of hit by pitches. So for us, that game was even more so a game in which we needed to hold our ground and just talk about the importance of staying on a plate, and driving the ball backside and, and, and knowing that the fastball is going to run. So if it starts in, it's going to run in, um, curveball is going to back up at times and, and those type of things. So I just think being really intentional about what you're looking for and looking for tells almost like you're playing poker. Man, I, I love hearing that. And, you know, I, I would even, without giving too much about what we do away, social media is also a resource that you can go in and you can find stuff like that since every tournament that they play in is now posting all kinds of videos about them. And, you know, that's the only reason teenagers are on it now to retweet that stuff. So you could go and find stuff like that. But that's the, PBR, PBR as well, because you can get all the film on your arms and, and yeah. chop up that film and watch it. And I mean, there's so many resources out there. I mean, it's, it's wild. Games are on YouTube, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, that's cool. It's a good idea. So I guess the last question, and I, this is, I'm gonna call it the legacy question, but if you had any advice or a resource or just anything and everything in general for the young, young coaches, the young crowd, you know, you're thinking first year, first couple of years, what would you leave them with to help them to continue to grow their career and uh, to to grow the next generation so it could be you know books or conferences or advice or quotes whatever you got but if you have one chance to give them something what would that be um i would say two th- two things like i i'm a, i'm addicted to twitter and i think people laugh about it and say you know you need to get off twitter i think i think read as much as you possibly can and then learn how to filter and so for me twitter's a huge avenue for that and i i read a ton on there and, and I'm on there constantly reading about math, reading about baseball and just being able to filter that information. But I also think reach out to as many people as you possibly can and connect with as many as you can. So like for me, baseball has been huge in the friendships I've made. I've got Matt Itner down at Cox high school in Virginia. Who's is just 
an unbelievable individual. I've got, uh, you know, I talked to Butch Chaffin or I talked to Sherman out in, in Texas or, you know, I can go on and on about the guys, even the ones that, within our own area. But I think just sharing ideas and bouncing ideas off of each other um, and trying to learn from that. And, and then also, like I said about the filter piece, it's, it's so important to take it as much as you can, but also don't try to use everything that you come across, like every single, you know, um, book you read isn't going to be go directly into your program, like being able to filter and take away what you want to use and things along those lines. I think that's important. Um, and then lastly, I think with the new coaches, everybody talks about how tough parents are. Our parents are awesome. They really are. And, and I think for you as an individual, whether you're a teacher or a coach, I think you just got to think about not trying to please everybody. Um, the most important people to please are, are your players and your students. Like those are the ones that are important. But I also think like, if you take a quote, if you think about like, never, you should never ever worry about the criticism of those that you wouldn't ask advice from. So if I'm not asking you for advice, then I'm not going to be overly upset by your criticism. And so I think that's, that's important, but just, just lock into the people around you, share ideas, try to connect with as many people as you can. Like you mentioned Mike Deegan, Mike Deegan might be the most, I don't know, the best human around. And he just happens to be a baseball coach. And he's a, he's a huge resource for myself. Um, and, and we're lucky in the baseball community to have just some rock star people. Uh, Greg Beals at Ohio state is always willing to help out our, our, our organization, our high school organization. He's right here at, at the Ohio state university. Um, but just connect with as many people as you can and, and keep trying to grow as a, as an individual. And then I think that'll in turn grow your program. Thank you for listening to ahead of the curve. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a rating or review wherever you are listening. I also wanted to remind you that you can find the video portion at the AOTC channel on stickandball.tv. Have a great week.